So uh, today I'll be speaking to you primarily about shale gas and shale oil, which uh, to set the context is one of uh, six or seven unconventional natural gas and oil resources, many of which occur here in Colombia. So what I propose to cover with you today is uh, to start with organic shale as the source rock for oil and gas, the depositional basins for oil shale and or shale oil and shale gas, where gas and oil comes from, how it's generated from organic shale, a, a very brief uh, word or two about technology developments in the history, uh, and then step through at a very high level, very introductory level, three examples from the US to demonstrate some of the uh, material covered earlier. And then I will close with a, uh, a few words on the importance of uh, shale gas uh, worldwide and in Colombia. So to begin at, with the very basics of uh, shale oil and shale gas, we'll start with what is shale? Uh, they are, uh, a shale is a rock that is deposited as a fine-grained sediment, uh, mud, that is clay and silt, in a very low energy environment with very little, very few currents, uh, very few waves, uh, as I say, containing uh, clay minerals and other constituents, and then with organic matter mixed in uh, with, the, uh, with the mud, which then becomes shale. So the conversion from the loose, water-saturated mud and uh, silt and uh, clay and silt into a hard rock of shale is a process of uh, occurs by heat and pressure, uh, a technical word being lithification. Shale in general, uh, if you pick up a piece of it, is a very boring rock. Uh, perhaps even so in outcrop, this is a slide of a shale bed, a series of shale beds, very thin bedded uh, uh, shale formation overlain by limestone formation. So this is a rather typical appearance of shale uh, in an outcrop in the field. As far as the organic matter that's in the shale, it consists primarily of marine single-celled organisms, microscopic uh, often con uh, consisting of algae, bacteria, and diatoms. This is a picture of, of diatoms, or which are one of the constituents of the organic matter that gets deposited with the mud that becomes the shale. As the shale is converted from loose water, fill, uh, water saturated mud, uh, in, as, it, as, it, as, it, as it's converted into shale, the organic matter that is uh, that is contained within it is converted to a substance called kerogen. And that process of lithification is called diagenesis. It's important to understand uh, in shale gas and shale oil the, uh, the environment in which the, the mud and then uh, the organic matter are, uh, are deposited. This occurs worldwide in different depositional basins which are areas of the earth of uh, sediment accumulation. Often these depositional basins uh, subside. They sink as additional sediment comes in and uh, places a uh, weight on the crust, then it will gradually subside as, this, uh, as sediment is, is deposited, resulting in many layers, as you see here, of different kinds of sedimentary rock including not only shale, but uh, sandstone, limestone, and, and other kinds of sedimentary rock. Sedimentary basins occur, as I said, worldwide. They occur both on the margins of continents, offshore, as shown in purple, and also within the continents as onshore basins, as shown in this green color. It's important to understand, as I say, the depositional environment of the uh, shale. If one considers a sedimentary basin, uh, starting from the edge of the basin, the types of environments are nearshore environments. Uh, B 
beaches, beach deposits, bay and lagoon, barrier island, uh, delta deposits, and so forth. And that's in the, at the very edge of the basin. And then there's a transitional zone from the continental shelf to the continental slope, as shown here. And then the deep basin, which is where the uh, marine shales and the organic shales uh, are typically deposited that become source rocks and, and the uh, uh, source of shale gas and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and shale oil. In the deep basin environment, the sediment comes in by two different methods, by density currents and by deposition uh, from the open ocean, which is called pelagic deposition. As I say, uh, deep marine, marine environments, very low energy. The very bottom of the basin is uh, very low in oxygen and uh, the uh, sediment and the organic matter that it contain, uh, contains comes in and is preserved at the bottom of the basin because of the lack of oxygen. If there were oxygen present, then the bacteria would work on the organic matter and break it down into uh, carbon dioxide and, uh, and water. So, uh, so this is the kind of the overview of the deposition, uh, of the environment of deposition. The amount of organic matter contained in the shale is highly variable from basin to basin and from shale to shale. This di these two diagrams intend to show uh, the two types of, uh, the two methods by which sediment gets into the deep water of the deep basin. Uh, first, there is the density current, also called uh, turbidity currents. As sediment accumulates on the edge of the uh, continental shelf and on the continental slope, it is very uh, unstable. It's filled with water. And if, uh, if a disturbance takes place, such as a, an earthquake, then the loose material, water-saturated material, becomes uh, activated and it and is somewhat denser than the, than the rest of the, of the water. And because of its higher density, uh, resulting from the sediment that it contains, it stays close to the, uh, to the uh, ocean floor and migrates down the, uh, the continental slope and then out on, on out into the deep, flat part of the basin. So that's the uh, density current or turbidity current source of of the sediment in the deep basin. In addition, uh, out in the open ocean, the, uh, uh, oftentimes in the uh, basin, the uh, water becomes stratified so that the upper strata has oxygen and the uh, algae uh, and bacteria through photosynthesis create, uh, uh, the organic matter is created and as the cells die off, the organic uh, matter that, that that they contain migrates downward through this pelagic environment through the other two layers until uh, in this lowest layer where the oxygen is depleted, uh, the, uh, the organic matter and some sediment uh, accumulates. And again, because of the low oxygen or anoxic environment, the uh, uh, organic matter is preserved and is not broken down. This complicated diagram shows uh, the similar concepts uh, in a slightly different way. Here we have turbidity currents, also called debris flows, they have a number of different names generated uh, up here in the uh, cotton top of the uh, continental uh, slope at the edge of the shelf, migrating down and then splaying out or spreading out over the uh, deep basin floor. And here you see the microorganisms you use your imagination. Uh, living in the photic zone or the uh, oxygen rich zone, dying off, and then the organic matter settles slowly down through the water column. Another term for oxygen free besides anoxic is eucinic or anaerobic. So that's where shale comes from, and that's where the organic matter within the shale comes from. How do we get oil and gas from, the, uh, from this organic shale? 
Well, as I said before, the organic matter content within the clay and silt, that is the, uh, the sediment that is transformed into uh, rock, that organic matter is variable, could be as high uh, in some basins as 10% or even more. Generally speaking, there must be at least 1% organic matter, also called total organic carbon, TOC. And then uh, what happens is there's a stepwise conversion of this organic matter into oil and gas simultaneously, at least to start with, with the lithification of the mud into shale. And the increasing temperature that leads to this stepwise conversion is due, in most cases, to the geothermal gradient. And the stages of conversion are referred to in the shale as thermal maturity. So here's a diagram showing the geothermal gradient. Everywhere on the surface of the Earth, either on continents or in the ocean basin, as, uh, there's an increase in temperature in this direction with depth. So this line shows as kind of an average of how the temperature uh, uh, below the Earth's surface increases as you go deeper. In fact, worldwide the average is about 25 degrees Celsius per kilometer of depth. And so what happens as these uh, depositional basins, as the subsidence takes place, the shale is carried deeper and deeper into the earth uh, as the basin gets, uh, becomes deeper. And uh, as the shales uh, go deeper in the earth, the temperature rises and that starts this process of thermal maturity in which the organic matter is converted uh, to oil and gas. So here's a, here's a chart showing thermal maturity uh, for petroleum up to a temperature of about 60 degrees Celsius. Uh, the oil then the shale is considered, the, the thermal maturity is considered to be immature. And that's the stage at which the organic matter, as I described previously, is converted to kerogen. Most of the uh, conversion takes place as a result of bacterial activity because it's still not uh, totally in the, uh, uh, in the uh, oxygen free condition. As the temperature rises above 60 degrees and up to about 160 degrees or lower, it's a, it's a wide range depending on the shale, sometimes as low as 120 degrees. That's called a mature thermal maturity stage with respect to petroleum and oil is the product. With the increasing temperature with respect to oil, we're in what's called the uh, post mature stage, which is for oil but then we're getting into the mature stage for gas. And I'll say something more about that in a minute. And so as we go into that higher temperature range with greater depth and higher temperature, uh, the natural gas begins to be uh, given off from the shale in the form of thermogenic methane. So here's a cartoon, a diagram, showing the conversion of organic matter first to oil and then finally to dry gas and then there is a wet gas stage uh, in between the two. Another cartoon showing uh, temperature, this time in Fahrenheit, with, uh, as a function of depth. And I think, hopefully if someone has a calculator, you can see that, that this, this temperature increase with this depth is about 25 degrees Celsius per 100 kilometers. And unfortunately, I couldn't find a diagram in meters, but uh, what you see here is because of the geothermal gradient and the increasing thermal maturity, at a depth of about 7,000 feet, the temperature reaches 150 degrees centigrade, about uh, 65 or, or 60 or 60, I'm sorry, 150 Fahrenheit, or about 60 or 65 centigrade. And then oil begins to form in the shale at, that, at about that depth going on down to a depth of about 18,000 feet or 6,000 meters, uh, oil, uh, oil is formed. That's the oil window. And then as the depth gets greater, the temperature gets higher, then we move out of the oil window and into the gas window, and here we see the thermogenic methane. So kerogen formed in the upper 7,000 feet, 
oil formed from 7,000 to 15,000 feet in depth, and then from that point, natural gas until all of the hydrogen is driven off, and the last stage then is the dead carbon with no, then you have hydrocarbon without hydrogen, and it's just carbon, and so it's no longer generating oil and gas. There's a lot of words on this slide. Uh, an important measure in um, shale gas development is the so-called vitronite index. And what, what that means, or what this parameter is, is there's one particular component of the organic uh, matter, which is called vitronite. And here's a, a piece in microscope. So if it's looked at under microscope, here's a, a microscope view, 20 microns, a, a, a bleb or a piece of vitronite formed from plant cells. And what, the, uh, what they do in the laboratory is they measure the light, amount of light reflected from these kinds of particles. Uh, it's a measure of light reflectance, and it varies from 0 to 3 percent. And what's nice about vitronite and the reflectance is that it's a very good indicator of the uh, thermal maturity of the shale so that the VI, when the VI reaches these values, that's the onset of oil, and when, they reach, when it reaches uh, 1.5 percent, that's the onset of gas generation. So a, uh, an experienced lab technician then can look at a piece of uh, organic shale source rock and from that deduce what is the, the stage of, of thermal maturity of the, of the shale and whether it should be producing oil, wet gas, or gas, uh, natural gas. So that gets the, uh, the oil formed out of the uh, organic matter. What happens as far as how the oil gets out of the shale, uh, it's believed that the kerogen, as it, which is a solid matter, as it is converted uh, with increasing uh, temperature to oil, it, it turns into a liquid. And this liquid then uh, bears some of the uh, geostatic pressure of the overlying layers of sediment. And since it's not a solid anymore, it becomes a liquid. It becomes a very highly pressured liquid. And it's the, this liquid under high pressure, it is believed that forms these fractures in the shale and allows the, uh, the oil to migrate out of the shale. You're going to hear a lot in future presentations about the technologies that have enabled us to uh, reach or to exploit shale oil and gas. But I want to cover uh, some of the elementary uh, aspects of it just to kind of complete the story uh, from my standpoint. Okay, if you take na uh, conventional natural gas and oil, when I was in undergraduate school a few years ago, uh, I was taught that there were three conditions required for an oil field. There had to be a source rock, like what we're talking about today, indicated here. There had to be a reservoir rock for the oil to migrate from the source rock into the higher permeability and porosity, whether it be a sandstone or a limestone. And then there had to be some sort of a trap to prevent the oil from migrating on up to the surface of the earth. And uh, conventionally, these wells, these reservoirs were tapped with vertical drilling technology. The situation is different now with, with shale gas and shale oil because of the advent of horizontal drilling and hydraulic fracturing. And as I say, you'll be hearing a lot more about this, but uh, the shale itself is typically very impermeable except for the fractures uh, that are formed when the kerogen is converted into, into oil. Uh, so if you take a, uh, a thickness of a formation with a vertical well, you only get a very small segment of the well exposed to the formation. And what happened with the, uh, with the uh, advent or the uh, development of horizontal drilling you get a much longer length of the well bore exposed to the formation, which allows much greater opportunity for the oil to reach the well bore. So here you have, say, 4,000 feet versus only 150 feet of the well bore exposed to the shale. Not only that, uh, with vertical drilling, uh, hydraulic fracturing was a well-established technology particularly for gas wells in tight formations, impermeable formations. 
that technology was transferred over to the horizontal wells and fracturing was accomplished at several locations along the, the length of this, of this horizontally drilled well so that you have the combination of the greater length and the fracturing which allows the hydrocarbons to migrate from the uh, shale into the well bore. And it's these two te technologies which were well established, <coughs> excuse me, in the oil field business, or in the uh, petroleum business, oil and gas business, they were applied uh, to this, to the source rock in a new way so that the reservoir is the shale itself. You don't have, to, the oil doesn't have to migrate to another formation. And the hydrocarbons are trapped you know, right there in the shale where they form. Some of the uh, oil, of course, migrates out, as I showed before, but a great deal of it remains in, inside the shale. So, uh, that was the, uh, those are the two developments that really made shale gas and shale oil development possible. That's just another diagram. I think it's in almost every shale gas and shale oil presentation showing the vertical portion of the well, the horizontal portion drilled in the shale, and the hydraulic fracturing at intervals along this long well bore, allowing the uh, oil and gas to get into the, uh, into the well. Here's an example. Uh, Carrizo Oil and Gas. Uh, we're going to talk more about the Barnett Shale in a moment. It's near Fort Worth in Texas on the University of Texas. I'm from the University of Texas at Austin. We have a sister university near Dallas and Fort Worth, particularly near Fort Worth, uh, called the University of Texas at Arlington. And they have put in a, uh, a well pad with a drill rig uh, that's expected to produce uh, as shown here. So here's a picture from an airplane of the well pad with the drill rig in the, in the well pad. And you can see these brick buildings in the background. That's the University of Texas at Arlington campus. This is an aerial photograph. And this is where that well pad is located. I believe this is intended to show the footprint of the campus. You remember we look back in this direction from the, uh, from the airplane, we can see these brick buildings. And this is land that is owned by the University of Texas at Arlington, a real windfall for the university. So these green squares then are the target endpoints for the horizontally drilled wells coming off of this single well pad. And there's the footprint again. And there's the horizontally drilled wells a very brief description of the history. We owe, I think, uh, a large part, if not almost all, of the uh, shale gas and shale oil development to this man. His name is uh, George Mitchell, whose company, Mitchell Energy and Development, working in the, the uh, Barnett Shale in the Fort Worth Basin that we just saw, applied these two technologies in a radical new way. Um, his concept of going to the source rock, which was traditionally felt to be much too impermeable to produce oil and gas. Uh, he, he persevered, uh, sometimes under ridicule, and uh, was finally, starting in 1981, took about 10 years uh, to he, until he achieved success in producing large volumes of gas, natural gas, uh, from the uh, Barnett Shale. Okay, three quick examples from the US, we'll uh, revisit the Barnett Shale briefly, then to the Eagle Ford, and then to the uh, Utica Shale. So Barnett Shale is in North Texas. Uh, these are two others, I'll, I'll get to this one in a minute. Uh, the basin, the Fort Worth Basin for the Bar uh, Barnett Shale is bounded by these two structural boundaries here. This is the main part of the basin, and the best gas producing shale is right here. And here, if you look carefully, well, probably even if you look carefully, uh, you couldn't see that this is Fort Worth and this is Dallas. So this is a highly urbanized area in which the uh, Barnett Shale is being developed. Uh, it's Pennsylvanian or Mississippian in age. Ranges from 4,000 to 9,000 feet in depth and from 3,000 to 800 feet in thickness. Many of these uh, oil shales crop out at the surface 
before they go down into the basin. And this is a, a shale outcrop of the Barnett Shale, a very uh, typical shale outcrop, not very interesting. Uh, as rocks go, very thinly bedded uh, because of these turbidity currents that come in and deposit these individual small thin layers. We saw this diagram earlier, this uh, concept of the origin of organic shale uh, is actually a model that was developed for the Barnett Shale. And again, you can see the, the turbidity currents and the pelagic uh, dip, uh, deposition from the open sea. Rather remarkable production statistics for the Barnett. Uh, it was uh, not until uh, there was a, a lot more application in the 1990s up to about 2004 that the, that the uh, production really took off from less than 500 a billion cubic feet to nearly 2,000 by, 2000, uh, by the year 2011. And this slide shows the urban drilling context that I mentioned. This is the tan area, is the Dallas-Fort Worth metropolitan area. And of course, each one of these blue dots is a shale gas well. So you can see there's a very strong imposition of the, uh, or correlation of the, of the uh, gas wells uh, with the uh, urban area res resulting in what we call urban drilling. A lot of competition for water resources, for example, for hydraulic fracturing, many impacts on the public infrastructure such as roads, concerns about environmental impacts like air emissions and so forth. There's a real convergence uh, between the issues of shale gas development and the population uh, in the case of the Barnett Shale. Uh, the Eagle Ford is the one in South Texas. We're very blessed, as we have been historically, uh, in Texas with hydrocarbon deposits. Uh, the Eagle Ford, again, a kind of a nondescript, relatively thin bedded organic shale. Here's a cross section. Oops. I want to tell the, way, tell the story. If we look across from northwest to southeast, this is the cross section of the Gulf Coast Basin. And here you see this is idealized, of course, with the straight lines. But the Eagle Ford is dipping uh, and increasing in depth uh, toward, the, uh, toward the, mid, uh, the, the mid part of the basin of the uh, Gulf Coast Basin. So it's, and it's overlain by younger thick sediments. And so if we look at a map of Texas, a closer map, you can see what's going on in the Eagle Fort. Here's the outcrop belt. Here's Austin, where I'm from, San Antonio. And if we look at the outcrop here, and then going under, uh, going deeper, to uh, dipping to the southeast, that's uh, uh, dipping deeper toward the basin, as shown by this dashed arrow. And because of the geothermal gradient, the Eagle Ford is exposed uh, first to uh, relatively cool temperatures. This would be the kerogen zone, where the organic matter is converted to kerogen. And then is the oil window as it gets uh, deeper. And then if you get all the way down to the end, here's the, uh, the gas window. And probably this is the, the point at which all of the hydrogen is dri driven off from the hydrocarbons, and you just have dead carbon from this point. And then here you have a wet gas window in the transition between the oil and the dry gas. A nice demonstration of how organic matter is converted to uh, oil and gas in, uh, for both conventional and unconventional reservoirs. Uh, a shorter period of production shown here, but very dramatic, going from almost zero in 2009 to uh, about 115,000 barrels per day in just a, a short two or three year period. And it's continuing to rise, of course. The Utica Shale is another example. It's in the northeastern United States. Here's the state of Ohio and Pennsylvania. Another uh, typical organic shale outcrop, very thin beds, probably from those individual turbidity currents or density currents depositing each of these little strata. Here's a cross section again from northwest, sorry, from northwest to southeast from A to B. 
here's A and here's B. And you can see, again, the Utica Shale is becoming deeper to the southeast and uh, getting higher up in the uh, geothermal gradient, resulting in a similar kind of picture. As we go deeper in the basin, as the, sh as the shale gets deeper, it goes up the geothermal gradient, and we now see the kerogen window here, the oil window here, wet gas here, and just a strip of the uh, dry gas here near the, the state line with uh, the state of West Virginia, actually. The, uh, let me just say a few words. I think this is fairly common, but uh, just uh, very quickly through the, uh, where we stand as far as this revolutionary new resource uh, and focusing just on shale gas for now. Note that the continent of South America leads the rest of the world as far as the amount of shale gas uh, uh, that's in the resource estimate. We saw shale, uh, sedimentary basins earlier. Shale gas is now believed to occur in at least 48 of these depositional basins in 32 countries all around the world. Tremendous impact on the geopolitical picture of energy supply throughout the world. A few words just about the U.S. case. Resource reserves are a, are a uh, component or a, a subset of the resource. The resource is typically higher, which means potential reserves, or it includes reserves and potential reserves. The reserves themselves are smaller at about, uh, oh, say 20% of the total reserves, and that's just 8% of the worldwide total that we saw earlier. Annual production in 2010, nearly 5 trillion cubic feet, which is about 25% of the natural gas production in the United States, and this is expected to increase to nearly 50% by the year 2035. Uh, again, showing diagrammatically on how the picture has changed so radically in just the last few years, less than a decade. Uh, proved reserves increased fivefold from the period from 2010, 2007 to 2010. Production also fivefold increased from 2006 to, 2007, uh, to 2010. And we're well blessed in the, U in the US with a broad distribution of these depositional basins that contain uh, gas-producing shale. Here in Colombia, uh, I saw just one reference. I'm sure it's out of date. Arthur D. Little in 2011 indicated these three locations uh, in Colombia, Cesar Rancheria, Mid Magdalena, and Eastern Cordillera. Uh, but uh, n more than 90% of the total is just in the uh, Mid Magdalena. Uh, there was no indication in this publication of shale, of shale oil in Colombia. In summary, so we've seen that unconventional natural gas and oil is, is just two of six or seven types of unconventionals. But they're arguably the most important of the, of the lot, at least in the near term. Organic shale is the source rock, not only for conventional, but also unconventional sources. They're deposited in, uh, typically in basins that are deeply buried by subsidence as subsidence occurs and that oil and, sh uh, oil and gas is liberated from the organic matter in the shale uh, through uh, the, thermal, the process of thermal, increasing thermal maturity uh, resulting from the geothermal gradient as the sediment gets deeper. They're exploited now because of the developments by Mitchell Energy through a combination of two very well-established technologies. These were not newly developed, but they were well-established in the uh, oil patch uh, uh, prior to Mitchell uh, applying them in this way. Starting in the 1980s and really developed the uh, technology in the 1990s. Revolutionary developments worldwide, as I said, and most of the uh, shale gas uh, here in uh, Colombia is in the uh, Magdalena Basin. I think that's all the time I have. I have a few slides on unconventional, on the other unconventionals, but let's, since I promised to focus just on oil and gas today, let's stop there. And if time permits later, we can talk about the others. So. How are we doing on time? Okay, good. All right. Thank you. 
Okay, can you hear me okay? Or anybody that cannot hear me, all right. Good, I was not sure of the time availability to cover the remainder of these slides as I indicated uh, in my first presentation. So fortunately, I think we have time for about another 15 minutes or so to cover at a very high level, very elementary level, uh, besides shale gas and shale oil, some of these other uh, natural gas and oil resources. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to be relying heavily on a report from Arthur D. Little from uh, 2011, which I think was, was important uh, in, uh, in Colombia for uh, uh, identifying what are the unconventional resources and the relative amounts that are available. So I want to give credit to the Arthur D. Little report uh, uh, right up front here. Okay, coal bed methane was one of the other six or seven that I mentioned at the beginning of the earlier presentation. And again, at a high level, uh, coal bed methane is, is, uh, is different from shale gas and shale oil. Uh, in the case of coal, of coal bed methane, uh, it is typically much shallower, a few tens uh, of meters or, or, or hundreds of meters as compared to thousands of meters for, uh, in the case of, of shale oil and shale gas. And so here's a diagrammatic uh, a picture of a coal bed which occurs uh, at, again, as I say, relatively shallow depths. Uh, and what happens is that the, the coal bed, because of precipitation uh, at, uh, at, the, uh, at the outcrop, becomes saturated with water. In fact, you know, this uh, uh, blue line indicates the uh, pressure surface uh, I think generally in a uh, in the coal seam in this diagram, and the methane that comes out of coal bed uh, methane is not the uh, from the transformation of kerogen uh, into oil and then wet gas and then uh, dry gas as we saw before, but rather instead the coal bed does not really reach the temperatures uh, because of the geothermal gradient. Typically, the coal is much shallower, does not get as deep in the, uh, in the geothermal gradient. And so instead, the methane comes from bacterial action on the coal itself. The coal is about one, almost 100% organic matter rather than being just a few percent or up to 10% in the case of shale oil. So coal, by definition, is a uh, one, almost 100% organic matter. There are a few impurities in the coal, of course, but, uh, but the coal is organic and it is at shallow depths uh, broken down by, uh, uh, by bacteria and releasing methane that is then uh, kept or stored within the coal bed. Now some of it may leak out over geologic time, but a large fraction of it remains in the coal. Now because the coal is saturated, as an aquifer itself. Some, in some communities, actually, coal beds are, are used as aquifers, not very often, uh, but, uh, uh, but the, the, because of the uh, saturation of the coal bed, the methane is trapped. Now, the coal itself, uh, like the shale, is relatively impermeable. Uh, the coal matter has a very low permeability, and the, whatever permeability the coal seam has is due to fractures in the coal rather than so much the, the coal material itself. And uh, under undisturbed conditions, the, uh, the coal seam or the coal bed is saturated with water. All of these fractures, and they're called cleats, C-L-E-A-T-S, uh, in the coal industry, uh, retain the methane in the water saturated condition. And so when a, an operator wants to uh, produce natural gas, methane from the coal, the first step is to go ahead, is to drill into the coal and treat it as though it were a water and, and have a, your well just as the same or, or almost the same as if it were a water well. It produce a vo large volumes of water as the initial stage in the production of methane. With the uh, production of a uh, large production of water, the, uh, the pressure surface lowers and in fact falls below the, uh, the top of the coal seam and the coal seam becomes unsaturated. 
the, and it becomes drained of the water. And when that, and when that occurs, then the methane that is, at, that is strongly adherent to the coal in the fractures and in the pores of the coal is released. Once the water is pumped out and it's desaturated or dewatered, then the methane can come out. And, so, and then, uh, then the uh, operator moves into the productive stage of the, uh, of the coal bed methane operation. And then, the, uh, and then the methane continues to be produced. The water continues to be produced to maintain the unsaturated condition in the coal seam so that it won't, won't fill back up again and trap the methane again. Uh, and then uh, that situation continues then and, uh, for the life of, the, uh, of, a, coal, of a coal bed uh, methane well. So it re uh, results in a large volume of, of water uh, being produced, which uh, in drought conditions or in arid areas of the world, such as we have in the southwestern United States, the, uh, the waste of this water is quite controversial. Uh, or, or the alleged way. So the management of the water just needs to be carefully addressed to avoid, avoid problems. Here in Columbia, thanks to uh, Arthur D. Little, we see uh, these locations of potential uh, coal bed methane. Uh, uh, Mr. Nygaard made brief mention at the start of his presentation about oil sands. Oil sands, often called tar sands, the reason the term oil sands is preferred is because, strictly speaking, tar refers to a, uh, a substance left over when coal is subjected to pyrolyzed conditions. That is, when coal is heated in the absence of oxygen, it, uh, it becomes uh, liquefied and some gas is, uh, is generated. And the residual in the uh, gasification of coal is tar. It really is coal tar, which means that uh, strictly speaking, although it's very common to use the term tar sands, the term oil sands is really preferable. So, uh, as uh, Mr. Dygaard mentioned, uh, the uh, tar sands comes from uh, uh, natural petroleum. What happens is the petroleum is generated at depth in the normal manner, as in uh, 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 conventional reservoirs. And the petroleum comes out of the source rock, comes into the reservoir rock, but the reservoir rock doesn't have it necessarily have a trap. And so the, uh, the petroleum continues to migrate up toward the source in the sand that is the reservoir, and it comes toward the surface because it's not trapped. As that happens, as the petroleum comes up toward the surface, the petroleum is attacked or broken down again by bacterial action. And what happens then is that this parent oil, which forms a depth and migrates toward the surface, is broken down, and most of the, uh, um, or much of the uh, more uh, volatile portions of the petroleum are removed by the action of the uh, bacterial breakdown, so that, it, so that what remains is the, uh, the non-viscous residuum after the petroleum breakdown that looks for all the world like uh, like, well, it can look like asphalt, but, uh, but typically it's softer, uh, as you can see in this picture. And there are two ways that it's extracted. Shown here is the, you know, mine and, uh, and process. It's uh, mined, uh, the oil sand is mined at the surface down to a depth of about 100 meters, uh, or, or it can be mined to that depth. And then the, uh, the oil sand is trucked, or sometimes by pipeline, uh, with uh, uh, with uh, water or something to, to be able to carry it in a, as a fluid, but more often, uh, more often trucked to uh, processing where the, uh, the uh, oil sand is uh, broken down uh, with heat and, uh, and other processes and becomes almost like a petroleum substance. It's kind of almost like a, a reconstituted petroleum. Uh, so as I say, there are two methods of extraction. Uh, historically, the surface mining uh, method has been uh, probably most used, uh, but the other method that is used is the uh, in situ method. I'm not going to say a great deal about that, but at depths greater than 100 meters where it's economically uh, infeasible to mine at the, at the greater depths, then there are a, a number of different methods of introducing heat or solvents into the subsurface 
and then recovering the uh, bitumen uh, either in, a, in a, a more liquid form because of the heating or in a dissolved form because of the solvent. Most well known uh, in the Western Hemisphere, uh, oil sands are the uh, Athabasca tar uh, oil sands. There you see, I almost made the slip myself. They were commonly known as Athabasca tar sands uh, in, the, uh, in the state of uh, Alberta, uh, which is in uh, Western Canada, as shown here. Uh, also, uh, Venezuela, our neighbors to the, uh, to the east, there's a, a great deal of uh, oil sand available too there in the uh, or Orinoco Basin. In Colombia, we have some uh, shown here at these locations, or at least it's so indicated in the uh, Arthur D. Little report. And then uh, there's some tabulated data indicating a total uh, of, uh, let's see here, oil in place, uh, uh, 60, almost 68 million barrels of oil in place in total, and uh, recoverable uh, by uh, SAGD is uh, one of the methods of in situ and by mining uh, the amount shown here. I was trying to think if I could remember that acronym, but I don't think I can right now. Thank you. Steam assisted gravity drainage. One of the three or four uh, pretty well demonstrated in situ methods. Oil shale. Uh, someone was asking me during the break, what's the difference between oil shale and shale oil? Well, that's a very good, very good question. Uh, oil shale is basically shale that contains organic matter that never made it. It didn't, it only has carriage and it was never converted to oil and gas. Uh, there is a very large and uh, probably the largest in the world deposit of oil shale in, uh, in the western part of the United States, in the Piance Creek Basin, those are lake beds uh, containing shale with abundant carrageen, but those lake beds were never, they never subsided down into the earth's crust, like the, uh, in the case of, of shale oil, so that the carrageen was never converted uh, by the processes I described earlier this, uh, this afternoon into oil and gas. So, here we have a lot of shale beds, very thick uh, occurrences of shale beds, some of them much more rich than others in kerogen. There's, there's a zone uh, called the mahogany zone that is very rich in kerogen that is primarily the, uh, has been uh, considered a target in the past. And again, we have two technologies, both a mine, mine it and retort it at the surface, and more recently the shell process, uh, uh, the uh, underground or in situ heating and pumping. Actually, there, there are more than one process. I shouldn't just mention the shell process, but a number of experimental uh, techniques have been tried for the uh, in place or in situ technologies. Oil shale has been uh, on the horizon as a potential source of petroleum since the early 1900s in the United States when it was uh, uh, part of the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, and it's a, a little bit like fusion nuclear power, it seems, in some respects. It's always just 10 years away and always will be. Okay, this quick uh, diagram very quickly shows the two methods, in situ and conventional mining and crushing, uh, just conceptually. There is uh, some oil shale here in Colombia, and due to the lack of time, I'm not going into the details. The last category in the most exotic, but also the most uh, prolific, potentially, is uh, methane hydrate. I should have mentioned, by the way, in the case of oil shale, and not been quite so negative about it, oil shale is actually used by direct combustion, just like coal uh, in uh, the country of Estonia, uh, in, uh, uh, in the former Soviet bloc. So uh, it is currently used as a fuel, and I, I should not have uh, misled you that way. Methane hydrate is very interesting. This is uh, the ice that burns. It is uh, a methane molecule trapped in water ice, below, the, uh, below freezing in other words. The water ice forms a lattice, and inside the crystal lattice, a uh, water molecule is trapped. 
Uh, it's typically formed at, uh, in two different kinds of, of environments, the continental, uh, that should be a continental shelf, and Arctic permafrost. Uh, the good news is there's more methane in methane hydrate than all the other hydrocarbon sources combined. The bad news is we don't know how to get it yet. It's still, uh, it's even more than 10 years away. Uh, there, are, there are active exploration uh, programs, partnerships between the U.S. Department of Energy and the private sector that continues to explore technologies for, uh, for extracting uh, methane hydrate. But at this time, uh, unfortunately, it's not yet available to us. Uh, due to the lack of time, I'm just going to say a couple of things. Uh, it occurs at many locations all around the world, and you see generally just on the uh, continental shelves around the, the major continents is, is where the major uh, deposits occur. Uh, we'll skip the concept of the resource pyramid. It's pretty standard uh, resource economics. Uh, here in Colombia, again, very richly blessed on both the Caribbean coast and on the Pacific coast, there are deposits of methane hydrate that will be available uh, when we figure out and understand how to, um, how to obtain it. And as I say, very large quantities available, not only, not only worldwide, but in Colombia. And uh, I think I'll just say there's uh, some, some problems for tight gas, which has already been covered, uh, but with a relatively smaller amount as shown here. Okay? Thank you.